Open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to start in Revelation chapter number 14. The reason I'm even in church this morning is because I believe this is important. Eternity's at stake. And I just, I don't take pastoring and preaching lightly. This is my calling, what God's given me, and I don't like to miss. I've missed one church service in 23 and a half years. And I wasn't about to start another, <laughs> another streak. And so uh, God's good. God is good. Revelation chapter 14, look at verse number 12. <clears throat> verse number 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus. We've been talking now for 18 weeks on the subject of faith in the Bible. This is part number 18, and I'm going to speak to you on those last four words of that verse that we just read, the faith of Jesus. That's what we're going to talk about today. Let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this morning. What a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord. And I thank you, Father. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your mercy, your kindness, your compassion. And Lord, I need you now. I need you, Holy Spirit, to fill me with your power. Lord, I need the mind of Christ so that I'll say exactly what you once said and not say anything you don't want said. I pray for everyone here to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Lord, if there's anybody among us that needs to be saved, I pray they'd get saved today. Those who need to follow you in believer's baptism, I pray that today will be the day they get baptized. And Lord, please speak to all of our hearts. Touch us and help us all to make whatever decision you want us to make. And we'll give you all the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The faith of Jesus. Now, we've been talking about for 18 weeks on the subject of faith. The faith of Jesus, just to give you, a, if you'd like to take notes, by the way, we're going to give you notes today to be able to take notes if you'd like. The faith of Jesus, it, here's basically what it is. It's whatever Jesus believes to be right and true. That's his faith. So when, when you see here in Revelation 14 and verse number 12, where it talks about the faith of Jesus, it is whatever Jesus believes to be right and true. Now, I'm going to spend the entire sermon how to make that applicable to you and your faith. Because Jesus has faith. It's called the faith of Jesus in the Word of God. Now, but I want it to change my life. I want my life, my faith, to be better because of it. And I want your faith and your Christian life to be better because of it as well. I'm going to give you four points this morning. And we're going to look at about eight different references in the Bible as we discuss these four points. And these are applications to help you to incorporate the faith of Jesus in your life. Number one, write this down. Always choose God's word over man's traditions. Always choose God's word over man's traditions. Look at Mark chapter number seven. Mark chapter number seven, please. Like I said, we're going to use our Bibles about eight times this morning. Mark chapter 7, and look down at verse number, number 7. Mark chapter 7, we're going to start reading in verse 7 and then go down to verse 16. Mark chapter 7 and verse number 7. Mark chapter 7, verse number 7, the Bible says, How be it in vain... Do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition." 
For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother. And whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand, there is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But those things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. You see, Jesus was talking to the disciples, and not just the disciples, but a great crowd. And he was preaching to them, and he said this, You worship me in vain because you worship me by teaching for doctrines the commandment of men. And then he said in verse 13, he says, you are making the word of God of none effect through your tradition. So what happens is in our society, churches all over America, Christians all over America are going to what we call religious-based churches. And it, <clears throat> at those religious-based churches, they are worshiping God primarily through the traditions of man. And the Bible says it is vain for us to worship God through the traditions of men. That we're supposed to worship God through the word of God. Now, sometimes people have to make a choice. You've got man's tradition on one side. You've got the word of God on the other side. The Bible says we should always choose the word of God over the tradition of men. Because the tradition of men, look. A man is a sinner, amen? A man is not God. A man is not perfect. God is perfect. God is holy and righteous and 100% just. And so the word of God, there's never any errors in it. There's never any problems with it. Why? Because it comes from God himself. Let, let me give you a thought. I, I, I'm going to share something with you that I think could really help you to understand. Look at John chapter number 1. John chapter number one, please. And I want you to start reading in verse number one. John chapter number one. Look down at verse number one. And watch this now. John chapter one, verse number one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Now jump down to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now we see here that the Bible says in the beginning was the word. Now, now, now listen, to this, listen to me as I try to help you understand. We all know that God is a triune God, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But before Jesus came to earth, and we're talking eternity past now, before the world was created, Jesus was not a, a, a son, if you please. He was the word. So in eternity past, before the worlds were ever created, there was God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and God the word. And the word, it says in verse 14 of John chapter 1, became flesh. That's Jesus Christ. Now watch this carefully now. I've often say that, I've, oft, I've, I've said this many, many, many times before. When you have your Bible, this is Jesus. Not the ink, not the paper, not the binding, the words. 
That is what Jesus is. When Jesus came to earth, he was a manifestation of the word of God. He is God, but it's, it, the word became flesh. Now watch this. That's why it's so important you don't mess with God's word. It's so important. If you mess with God's word, if you change God's word, if someone rewrites God's word, if someone eliminates verses or changes words to be something else than what God intended it to be, then what happens is not only are you changing God's word, you're changing Jesus Christ himself. You all have heard of the Antichrist, right? You've heard of that? Well, the Antichrist is one who claims to be Christ but is not. That's an imposter. Well, you know what I also think? Now watch this. Not only is there an Antichrist, but I believe there's an anti-word. You see, it's the Word of God that became flesh. When you change the Word from what God meant it to be, then you have an anti-word. And the result of an anti-word is an anti-Christ. Now listen to me carefully. That's why it is so important that you embrace the King James Bible in the English language. The King James Bible is God's perfectly preserved word in the English language. It has the breath of God upon it. You don't need an easier Bible to, to, to understand. You just need the Holy Spirit of God to help you to understand the King James Bible. But when you mess with the word, you're messing with Jesus. Now watch this. It is so important that you understand God's word should always trump the traditions of man, man's tradition. Don't ever let man's tradition get in the way between you and God's word. You always stick with God's word over man's tradition. I wrote this down. Any tradition not founded in God's word will cloud the faith of Jesus in your heart and in your mind. Where can I find the faith of Jesus? I'll tell you exactly where you can find the faith of Jesus. In the word of God. Amen? Now watch this. The faith of Jesus is anything that Jesus believes to be right and true. And the place we find that is in God's word. So that's where we need to look. Number two. Write this down. <clears throat> be consistent with this faith. Be consistent with this faith. Look at James chapter number two. Look at James chapter two. James chapter number two. And look down at verse number one, please. James chapter two. Look down at verse number one. James chapter 2 and verse number 1, it says this. My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. All right? So God tells us not to have the faith of our Lord with respect of persons. Now, what does that mean? Here's what this means. Listen to this carefully. If it's right for you, it's right for me. It's right for all. God's word, his, his faith, is not situational. In other words, adultery is wrong if you commit adultery. Adultery is wrong if I commit adultery. Adultery is wrong if anybody commits adultery because adultery is wrong. has nothing to do with respect of persons. has nothing to do with, you know, who's the one that's committing the adultery. The fact of the matter is we get ourselves into trouble when we believe what we believe because of respect of persons. I, I remember years ago, this real famous lady uh, passed away, and I, I'm not uh, going to call her name or anything like that, but it was a, a, someone that was known all around the world. And this famous lady passed away, and someone came up to me in church after it happened. She goes and said, oh, that, that woman went to, went to heaven for sure. And, and I looked at her or him, and I said, well, why, why are you saying that? Why would you say she went to heaven for sure. And, and he said to me, oh, man, she was such a good person. She was so good. And, and my soul, she did so much to help so many people all over the world. 
And I looked at him and I said, man, what does the Bible say it takes for a person to go to heaven? What does it say? You got to be, you got to be saved. You've got to ask Jesus Christ to save you. Now, you live a good life all you want, but nobody's going to heaven because they lived a good life. If that woman, who, who was a very famous woman uh, 14, 15 years ago, if she did go to heaven, it's not because of all the good works she did. It's because she personally asked the Lord to save her. That's the only way anybody goes to heaven. I remember one time I was out soul winning not too long ago, and I met this, this guy, and he told me about his grandmother that passed away. And I was, I was witnessing to him, sharing the gospel with him, and he said, boy, I know my grandmother went to heaven. I said, oh, okay, good. He goes, because if anybody's going to heaven, she is. She is such a good person. Well, do we get to heaven by being a good person, or do we get to heaven by being saved? You see, you get to heaven by being saved. But what happens is when you have respect of persons, it clouds your faith. It muddies the water, if you please. It makes it not as crystal clear as it is in the Bible. Okay, look, look, okay. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk. You know, <laughs> those of you that are visiting, you have to kind of put up with me. But I, 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 don't, I don't mind talking about controversial issues and hot topics and stuff in our society. All right, so watch this now. 40 years ago, if you went to any church in America, or most, most every church in America, and, and most every Christian in America, and asked them about homosexuality. Yes, that's right. They would have said the exact same thing. Um, 40, <coughs> 40 years ago, if you asked any, any church or any Christian who was a devout Christian about homosexuality, they would, they would all, almost, almost like 99.9% .9 would say, well, it's a sin. It's an abomination to God, according to the Bible. But now things have changed. I remember when I first, th there's a couple of people that I, I met years ago uh, when I was pastoring here, and, and, and they used to say, man, homosexuality is a sin, and, and, and call it like it is, preacher. And then they had a relative come out of the closet. And they had a relative declare that they were gay. And you know what they started doing? Well, preacher, you know, you don't want to talk about homosexualities being a sin now. And uh, we got to understand if they're born that way. And, uh, and, and just, and I said, wait, 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 time out. Why did you change your beliefs? I'll tell you exactly why. They had a relative that came out to be gay. And so what happened was now it's all okay. Now it's not such a bad thing. Why? Because they had respect of persons. They had known somebody who was committing that sin, and therefore it's okay. But if they didn't know anybody committing that sin, then preach against it, preacher. Preach against it. Why? Because it's, 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 it's not a big deal. But when a, a personal attachment comes into play, then you are in danger of having respect to persons. So I said, number one, talking about the faith of Jesus, always choose God's word over man's tradition. Number two, be consistent with this faith, all right? Now, let me give you some things to think about. By the way, having respect to persons will cause you to choose people over Jesus. Y'all with me now? Having respect of persons will cause you to choose people over Jesus. Now, let's look at a few verses here. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter number 19. Turn in the Old Testament to 2 Chronicles chapter number 19, please. <clears throat> Second Chronicles, chapter number, let's see here, 19, verses 6 and 7. Second Chronicles, chapter number 19, and look down at verse number 6. God is good, amen. Second Chronicles, chapter 19. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 6. 2 Chronicles 19 and verse number 6, the Bible says this, And said to the judges, Take heed what ye do, for ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons nor taking of gifts, all right? So God says this, when God makes a judgment call, when he, he's the judge of the universe, amen? Now, 
now it's okay for us to judge in, in, in the right place, in the right time, right setting. But God says, when you judge, and he said to the judges now, he says, when you judge, don't have respect of persons. Now watch this carefully. We live in a society in America that has a lot of broken things. A lot of things are broken. I mean, look, look, at, look at what happened down in Florida last week. You know, we have a broken society. You know, we, we've, got, we've got, I think, what was it, 60, was it 60 million babies have been aborted in our country since Roe versus Wade. Is, is, I think that's the number, 60 million. We've got a lot of things broken in our society. One of the biggest things that is an indicator of how broken our society is, is when politicians break the law and they get away with it because they're a politician. Now that's wrong. That is a judge who is executing judgment with respect of persons. Some of the politicians in the last election, man alive, if you and I would have done some of the things that they've done, we'd have been thrown in jail, locked away. We, we would have had the, the, the book thrown at us, but because of their political name, they, you know, it just gets like looked the other way. And it's just, it's, it's insane to me. It's absolutely insane that someone could break the law, but because they're a politician, they're allowed to get away with it. You know what that is? That is bad judgment. That is someone who says, I don't care, God, about what righteousness is. I am judging based on respect of persons. And if we judge based on respect of persons, we're not doing justice. We're not doing what God wants because God never judges with respect of persons. You know what God says? If it's sin for one, it's sin for all. If it's right for one, it's right for all. God doesn't have respect of judgment, uh, respect of persons. Look at Proverbs 24. <coughs> Proverbs chapter 24. And look down at verse number 23. By the way, those of you that have just started coming to our church, you'll learn real quick, we are people of the book. I'm not going to get up and preach religion. And I'm not going to get up and preach my ideas and philosophies of life. I am going to get up and preach the word of God. We are people of the book. Look at Proverbs 24. And verse number 23. The Bible says, These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to have respect of persons in judgment. All right, so God says, If you want to be a wise Christian, don't have respect of, of persons when it comes to judgment. You, you let the word of God say what's right and what's wrong. All right, next, look over at Romans chapter number two. Romans chapter number two. And look down at verse number 11. Romans chapter two. And verse number 11, the Bible says, for there is no respect of persons with God. Once again, God is declaring, I have no respect of persons. You know what that means? That means God has no pets. He has no favorites. God doesn't treat Pastor Sulian different than he treats you. Listen to this statement. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. You know what that means? When all of us come to Jesus and we're standing at the foot of the cross, we are all on level ground. There's nobody better than anybody else. There's nobody worse of a sinner than anybody else. Listen to this very carefully. Can you imagine one piece of dirt telling another piece of dirt, man, you're dirty? <laughs> we're all sinners. We all have problems in our lives. We have no right to stick our nose up in the air or look down upon anybody else because we're not, they're committing different sins than we have. There's no respect of persons. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all in the same boat. All right, let's look at another verse. Look over now, if you would please, to Colossians chapter number three. 
Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, and look down at verse number 23. Y'all still praying for me? I'm trying to make it. Have I turned pale again? <laughs> what was that? I'm almost there. <laughs> All right, man. Well, if I start speaking in tongues, it's not me, okay, folks? It's not me. It's just... <laughs> I, I don't speak in, I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> Y'all, you know, when someone does that, you know what that means, right? Y'all have heard me tell you that. My head hurts, my stomach hurts, I can't find my cigarettes. All right, that's what it means. But anyway, all right, Colossians chapter 3. Look down at verse number 23. Colossians chapter 3. And uh, I have fun in church, so it's okay to laugh, amen? As long as you're not laughing at me. That's all. That's okay. All right. Look at verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Now look at verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. You know what God says? If you're a pastor and you do wrong, if you're a church member and you do wrong, if you're a child and you do wrong, if you're an adult and you do wrong, it doesn't matter. You'll receive the reward of what you did because of what you've done. There was a famous preacher years ago got caught breaking the law. And here's what his defense was. He stood before the judge, and here's what he said. He said, Judge, I have spent 40 plus years of my life serving God, helping people, doing all kinds of good to all kinds of people. Yes, I made this one transgression. Would you please take those 40 years of good doing and help excuse this one time that I transgressed? Now, when that preacher went before the judge, and that was his argument. That was his case. It was completely unbiblical. He broke the law. He committed a crime. And the judge said, look, man, I don't care what you've done for the last 40 years. What you did was an egregious crime against society. And you hurt a family deeply with what you did. You are going to go to jail. And he, and he got uh, sentenced for 10 years in jail. But here's what happened. He tried to get it excused or minimized because of all the good that he had done in the past. You know what that'd be like? That'd be like me going to God after I've done something I shouldn't have done. I say, God, I know I shouldn't have done it, but, you know, I am the pastor of Hopewell. I've done all these good things for all these years for all these people. Would you just kind of look the other way this one time? Would that be okay, God? God ain't going to do that. Listen, when you do right, he will bless you. When you do wrong, he will punish you. And there's no respect of persons with God. Sometimes we think that it should be that way, but that's, that's our sin nature. It's not ever going to be that way. God's never going to have respect of persons in judgment. This is perhaps the biggest obstacle that people have when following their faith of Jesus. The biggest obstacle is they have respect of persons, and the respect of persons gets in the way of the faith of Jesus. Number three, write this down. I said number one, always choose God's word over man's traditions. Number two, be consistent with this faith. In other words, don't have respect of persons. Number three, never let circumstances keep you from following the faith of Jesus. Never let circumstances keep you from following the faith of Jesus. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 9. Y'all still with me this morning? My, uh, my water glass is just about empty, so when it empties, i got to be done preaching. 
So we're getting close to the end. <laughs> we're getting close to the end. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 9. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Point number three is this. Never let circumstances keep you from following the faith of Jesus. Do you realize 11 of the 12 disciples died martyrs' deaths? The only one who didn't was Judas Iscariot, and he committed suicide. But the other 11 apostles, they were martyred for the cause of Christ. John the Apostle was exiled to an island called Patmos. The best way that I can explain it to you, do you all remember a place called Alcatraz years ago? I grew up in California. That's why I'm a little nutty today. But anyway, I grew up in California and uh, in the Bay Area. And just off the Bay Area, there is a, hey, I may be a nut, but I'm screwed onto the right bolt. Amen? All right. So there you go. All right. But there's an island just off of the Bay called Alcatraz. Now, now it's a tourist place. You go there and you get to walk around in the place and all that. And it's kind of like a tourist thing. But years ago, <coughs> it was a prison. And it was for people that were executed to live the rest of their days out in prison, never to get parole. They were going to die in prison. It was for the most hardened of criminals. They didn't want them in the mainland. They wanted them on an island, and it was called Alcatraz. Well, back in the Bible days, John was exiled to an island called Patmos, very similar to what Alcatraz was in America. And he was put there for one reason, for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was a preacher of God's word, and it landed him in exile on Patmos. But you know what? Even though his circumstances were very difficult, he kept the faith of Jesus Christ. Let me give you another verse to look at along this line. Look over at John chapter 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15, and look down at verse number 20. God is good, amen? I think I'm getting my second wind. Maybe I can preach for another hour. Would that be okay? <laughs> Amen. So, some of you are going, what? Another hour? <laughs> John chapter 15. Look at verse number 20. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. Now watch this carefully. If you want to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, the world is going to treat you just like it treated Jesus. Does anybody remember how the world treated Jesus? Right there. They persecuted our Savior. And if you are his follower, they are going to treat you the same way that they treated him. You've got to expect it. Every once in a while... So often, when people come to a church like ours, they come on a really good premise. Their family invites them. Their friends invite them. Man, they, walk, they come to church, and the first time they come, they get saved. And then most of them get baptized the exact same service. They get saved. And, man, they're on this spiritual high. And, oh, my soul, they've, they've never been to a church like this where the pastor tells such funny jokes. I mean, they've, uh, they've never been in a church where the preacher just preaches the word like it is and not, not like, you know, the religious-based churches they've been in the past. And it's refreshing and it's exciting. And they get saved and they get baptized. And they're like, wow, I'm on this spiritual high. And they start coming back, and they have a great time, and they, they love living for God. And that lasts a few weeks or a few months. And then they get persecuted. Then they get family members that don't want to be around them anymore because they've changed. They got friends, maybe, that might turn their back on them. 
They, they, they've got things that happen. They might lose a job maybe because, because that's how the devil works sometimes. Something goes wrong in their life and now they're getting persecuted. And here's their knee-jerk reaction. I thought if I was going to live for God, everything in my life would just be better. And now there's this problem, this persecution, this difficulty. I guess, I, I guess it just wasn't what it was cracked up to be. And then they stop coming to church. They stop living for God. Why? Because of persecution. Now listen this carefully now. You've got to look at this thing square in the eye. If they persecuted Jesus and you act like him, they're going to persecute you too. Don't let it deter your faith in Jesus. Don't let it make, look, don't be a sunny, fair-weathered, bandwagon Christian. You be for God in the dark days as well, in the storms of life as well, when the persecution comes as well. You do what God wants. You believe how God wants you to believe no matter what circumstances you face. Number four and last, look at John chapter number 12. This will be the last reference that we look at. John chapter number 12. And look down at verse number 47. <clears throat> John chapter 12, and look down at verse number 47. Ready? The Bible says, and if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Number four, write this down if you're taking notes. One day we will all be judged by the faith of Jesus. One day we will all be judged by the faith of Jesus. Now watch this very carefully. A lot of people have got a lot of misconceptions about things, and this is one of them. When you die... You're going to stand before God for a judgment, a judgment day. When you stand before God, God is not going to judge you based on your beliefs. God is not going to judge you based on what the world believes. God is not going to judge you based on how your parents believe. When you stand before the Lord, he's going to take his word. He's going to say, how close did your life measure up to this book? That's how he's going to judge you. That's how he's going to judge me. We're not going to be judged on any other platform. We're not going to be judged on the fact that it's 2018 and the whole world, you know, America's going to hell in a handbasket, you know, and so therefore, you know, I was living the way I lived because of it, and, you know, and it was just the way it is when I grew up, and, and the society in which I was, or, or the home I grew up in, or the time period. No. God says, look, Jesus came to earth, and he said this. He goes, look, I didn't come to judge anybody. Jesus said, I came to save the lost. I came to save people. He says, but one day you will be judged, and I'll tell you who's going to judge you. The Word. The Word. Where is the Word? It's right here. You know what you ought to do? You ought to understand that one day when you stand before the Lord, you, you will be judged by the faith of Jesus. So you better get ready. You better get ready. So preacher... How can I get ready? Here's the conclusion. By the way, I wrote this down. In the end, all that matters is what Jesus believes to be true and right. That's it. In the end, that's all that matters. Not what you believe, not what I believe, not what a church believes, not what a society believes. In the end, all that matters is what Jesus believes to be true and right. So here's what you need to do. Here's my concluding four points. Write this down, letter A. As a Christian... You should live by faith. As a Christian, 
Letter A, you should live by faith, not feelings. Don't live by what feels good. Don't live by what makes sense to you. Live by faith. Letter B, write this down. Find out what Jesus believes. Find out what Jesus believes. Where, where, where can we find what Jesus believes? In the Bible. So start studying your Bible. Read it. Listen to it being preached. Study the Bible because that's what Jesus believes. Letter C, always live by his beliefs. Always live by his beliefs. Now, most people live by their own personal beliefs. But like I said, since you're not going to be judged by your beliefs, you're going to be judged by his faith, then you should start living by his faith. Live by it. And then letter D and last, write this down. Everything will turn out good if you do. Everything will turn out good if you do. You know what? Sometimes, often, people get mad at preachers. Now, I know I've never experienced that in 23 and a half years. Nobody's ever gotten mad at me. But oftentimes, people get mad at preachers. And one of the accusations they throw at us is, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever said it? <laughs> but watch this. I'm not up here today saying, Pastor Sulian's faith is right. Follow my faith. Believe my faith. I'm not up here doing that. I'm up here saying the faith of Jesus is right. And I'm trying to encourage you to follow the faith of Jesus. Now, because the faith of Jesus is right, the default reaction is anything that is different then the faith of Jesus is wrong. But it's not personal. It's not the Baptist way to heaven. It's not Pastor Sulian's way to live. It's Jesus' way. What does Jesus believe? You find out what that is. You live by faith. You follow the faith of Jesus. You let that be what you believe. And in the end, you'll be so glad you did. I promise you this. The Christian life is not all that complicated. It really isn't. Are you willing to yield your beliefs to Jesus' belief? If you are, you'll be on the right road and you'll never get off. But when you throw up your beliefs or throw up somebody else's beliefs or somebody, uh, society's way to believe, well, this is, you know, society has evolved. Yeah, really? Really? 40 years ago, was there ever a shooting in a, in a schoolhouse? I'm, I'm serious now. Society hasn't evolved. We, we're going downhill fast, folks. Te technology may be getting, you know, technology. These dumb phones, they're so, they cost so much money, and then they only last for two years, and then they're no good anymore. Oh, man, society ain't all that great. Uh, advancement, it ain't all that great. Come on now. Listen very carefully. Listen very carefully. You stick with the faith of Jesus, and that'll be the best way that you can live. Let's pray.